Welcome everybody. I wish I could be with you in person, uh, but nevertheless, great to be with you on film, and I hope you enjoy Peter and my conversation. So I'm delighted to be here with you today. Thanks for spending the time to talk to us. Thank you, Peter. So let's start the conversation by, um, could you tell us how you came to the Catskills? Yes, uh, Ross and I met individually when we were single in New York, married. And soon after uh, that, uh, because we had both grown up in the Western North Carolina mountains camping, uh, we said, where can we bring that back to life? And uh, there the Catskills were. So we started out camping in the Catskills. And were you fly fishing at that point? No, we didn't know the first thing. Uh, Ross had an uncle and I had an uncle, each of whom were avid fly fishers. Uh, Ross's uncle invited us to his club down in those very same Western North Carolina mountains. Um, and we went down there. We didn't have a piece of gear, although Ross did buy some hip boots at uh, Abercrombie and Fitch. Uh, they loaned us everything else. And that was where we started catching. We caught little trout right off the bat down there. So um, as you uh, kind of became more interested in the world of fly fishing, um, I understand that you met Harry Darby and he became an important part of your life. Yes, and that was a really quirky story. Uh, Ross and I, now that we were fly fishers, we camped down on an island on the lower Beaver Kill near Peakville uh, where Trout Brook comes in. And we'd been in there on this island for about three days and all of our uh, campfire cooking and so on, we came out in real need of a hamburger and beer fix. Uh, and there was a little bar right there, uh, known locally as the Snake Pit. Uh, we went in, uh, we got our hamburger, our beer. Smitty, the bartender, learning that we were beginning fly fishers, wanted right away to show off his expertise. And so he reaches under the bar and pulls out this fly box and pulls out a real bushy looking fly and hands it across the bar and says, here, take this fly. It was tied by Harry Darby. Well, I had no idea who that was, but of course I didn't question him. I took the fly a week or so later. I was fishing near the Beaver Kill covered bridge. I put it on. I started walking up the river a little bit with my fly line trailing behind and it went over this little fall into the mouth of a 15-inch rainbow trout. I had never caught anything bigger than about 10 inches, but I managed to get this fish in, let it go, and said, boy, I gotta have some more of these flies. And so I clipped it, saved it, and then shortly after that, got in the car, went down, asking people where the Darby's, found the house, his parking lot was just jammed with cars. I uh, went in, the house was full of people. Uh, they were more or less crowded around this one man over in the corner, and of course I knew that had to be Harry Darby. So I had to wait my turn. I finally got up close enough to him. I reached in, I pulled out the fly, and I said, Mr. Darby, I, Smitty down in Peakville gave me this fly you tied and I caught a fantastic 15 inch rainbow with it. I would sure like to. And he looked at it in kind of a puzzled look. He says, I never tied that damn fly. Well, of course, I was very embarrassed and crestfallen, but I stayed for another hour and uh, back and forth listening to all these people. I came out of there having I uh, met this guy thinking, Smitty uh, really did me a bigger favor than he realized. He's introduced me to a man who's going, who has changed my life. So um, you and Ross got to be close friends uh, with the Derby. Yes, we did. Uh, we would actually come up from the city every Friday night. We were renting a little cabin near Junction Pool. It had no water, no electricity. So we would arrive at the Darby's with an empty six gallon water carrier and a full quart of Dewar's Scotch. And Harry enjoyed that and I did too. So uh, we would, uh, by the end of the evening, uh, 
listening to Harry's stories and so on, we would leave for our cabin with a full six-gallon water carrier and an almost empty bottle of Dewar's. So yes, we were very close. Um, tell me a little bit about the um, kind of stories and the, and the interactions that you had. One of Harry's real charms and magnetism was his charisma and his storytelling. People far and wide would come just to sit and listen to him. And so these evenings together, when we were, in his terms, getting as comfortable as possible, charming phrase, obviously you knew what it meant. Uh, one night we were getting very comfortable and Harry started telling his stories and he would say, I'm saving, that's going in my book. And then he would tell another story, mention his book. Or he had a formula for dying rooster necks. I'm saving that for my book. Well, I'd been hearing this often enough till I realized he's never going to tie, excuse me, he's never going to write a book. And so I just blurted it out and without thinking, Harry, tell your stories and have fun. You're not going to write a book. Well, he went quiet. And all of a sudden I realized that I'd hit a nerve and we both kind of choked up because we realized that I had destroyed his dream in effect. Well, I said to him, Harry, the only way you're going to write a book is if someone sits down with you and makes you do it. Yeah, I guess you're right, he said. And then I said, well, don't you have somebody to do that? No. And then whatever made me say it, well, how about me? Sure. Well, the next morning I came back, cold light of day. Harry, you remember what we said? Yes. Did you mean it? Yes. Well, that began a four-year process that in 1977 we published Catskill Fly Tire, My Lifetimes and Techniques. So um, clearly Harry's stories had a lasting impact on, your, on you and your life. Very much so. He would always speak of the Catskills as the birthplace of American fly fishing. And he said that often enough. So later, uh, I really said, well, where's the proof of that? And maybe there needs to be a book. And he had, in effect, planted the seed for this book by all of these things he had said about the Catskills. So I started that. Uh, that took about another four years and became Katska River's birthplace of American fly fishing. Over the years, uh, obviously that's been printed various times, and what kind of impact um, did that have, and, and, and how did it sort of reflect that era? Well, as much as Harry was telling these stories, there was his dear wife, Elsie, and says she was a master fly tire, but she was also had a lot of vision about this area, and she had a dream that there should be a museum. And indeed, I think it was 1981, the Catskill Fly Fishing Center and Museum Incorporated, and Elsie became the first president. And now here you are, Peter. You're going to inherit that legacy of Elsie, and I understand later tonight we're going to hear from you what your plans are. Absolutely. Um, so uh, are you working on any other books at the moment? Uh, yes, I am. As a matter of fact, I thought, well, you know, Harry told me about his life, and so that was like a told-to-the-author uh, story of his life. It was really an autobiography. But there was no biography. And as he had his own stories, but then there were all the stories that the people told about him, all the history from the outdoor writers and everything. So I started in in 2012 interviewing people who knew the Darbys well, and it is still ongoing. I've gotten so deep, I've called it a research rabbit hole. Uh, now I'm in my ninth year with some interruptions. Uh, I'm calling this book uh, tentatively, but it seems accurate, The Darbys of Roscoe, an American Fly Fishing Phenomenon. So uh, through your, your research, uh, I, I think that you've learned new things about the man that you knew that I, you, that you yes. uh, were unaware of. Is it I you? certainly have. It's amazing as much as he talked about his uh, love of the rivers. 
uh, I've learned how important he was as a fighter uh, during the middle 1900s, standing out really as perhaps the leading environmental activist uh, fighting for the rivers. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, there is one where in 1957, they were spraying for gypsy moths on the Neversink River. And they killed all these gypsy moths, all right, but they also killed the water bugs, the aquatic insects that the trout feed on. And those bugs would float to the surface, the trout would eat them, and then it would kill the trout. Or the birds would come down and eat the bugs and it would kill the birds. So he uh, organized a group of people. They went along the rivers collecting these dead fish, freezing them, and they became evidence in the fight uh, that really Rachel Carson spearheaded with Silent Spring to outlaw DDT. That was one big fight he was in. Uh, another one was uh, when they extended Route 17 down the Beaverkill Valley as a four-lane expressway. Uh, replacing a little country road. They had a design, the engineers put a design together where they were going to reroute the willow Creek, channelize it, and they were also going to put piers to hold the bridges all down the beaver kill. Harry got big involved in that and uh, wanted the road to run along the ridges, which was possible. But uh, he at least got the willow Weemock saved. It was left in its bed as it flowed. Uh, and he also got a lot of uh, moderations where the uh, bridges and road crossed the river. So they won some battles, but they lost that war. Actually, the, the, the specific stretch of the willow Weemock that they would have been looking at is the one that runs right by where the current museum, where the, where the museum Exactly is. so. So the museum wouldn't have a river if that had happened. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. So it's clear from these examples that Harry has had a, a, a major impact on environment, environmental protection of this region. What do you think his, how do you think you could summarize his, the legacy of that? Well, one way in particular is that the fight is still going on. Uh, I see his legacy is that we have to learn how to continuing the fight. Uh, and follow his fine example. Uh, and one example of that is that there was a group called the Catskill Waters who were involved in once again fighting the city as the enemy, New York City. Releases were killing fish. They weren't giving enough water below their dams. Uh, and that took about four years and ended up with a victory uh, and a law that got signed taking the releases of the dams away from the city and giving it to the DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation. So uh, that, that fight, uh, however, thought it was won, but no, the city fought back. It is still ongoing. So we need to become, as it were, uh, little Harry Darby's or an army of Darby's, whatever you like. So. By that you mean his fight is something that we have to still continue to be aware of. Absolutely. And for those people who uh, come up here, you've been here some time. Over 55 years. 55 years. So what, when you look around at the rivers and the mountains, what do you see? I see that it's amazingly still pristine and wild, and it's because of the example that Harry set and people who've come after him, that it's his legacy. And that legacy really is embodied in the Catskill Fly Fishing Center and Museum. Uh, it's part of what we're learning that all these traditions, you have to fight hard to protect them. We have to keep fighting, uh, as his friend Sparse Gray Hackle used to say, vigilante. Uh, I look forward to reading your book. Can you, uh, can you tell me uh, when it might be coming out? Well, uh, as I think you know, I'm also the publisher with my little company, Beaverkill Press, but when you're both the author and the publisher, there are no deadlines, which is unfortunate. I'm in my ninth year, but I very much hope to have it out by next spring. Well, that's exciting, so I can't wait to read it when thank it comes you. out. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for, for talking to us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's been my privilege and honor.